Welcome to the kill death ratio, where I count all my kills and all my deaths. Today, I'm playing Resident Evil Village. Released in 2021, we pick up three years after the events of Resident Evil 7 with Ethan, Mia, and their six month old daughter Rose. After their daughter is kidnapped by series mainstay Chris Redfield, Ethan is forced to fight for his survival in search of her. Heavily inspired by Resident Evil 4, Village leans into the action while blending the survival horror elements the series is known for. Now that Ethan Winters has received some military training, he's more adept at combat, which also means we'll have plenty of kills to count, so let's cut this intro here and get started. I select standard difficulty and we begin with an opening storybook cinematic of a girl getting lost in the woods and receiving gifts from various monsters that foreshadows what's to come. Easily the most unique intro in the series, it's reminiscent of the tale of three brothers told by Hermione in The Deathly Hallows Part 1. We cut to Mia to find out she's reading this story to her baby Rosemary. What is with the creepy story? Mia gets short with Ethan when he brings up how overtly unsettling that story was, and explains it away as a local tale as the Winters family moved to an unspecified location in Eastern Europe that's most likely in Romania based on the landscape and currency used in the game. Plus, what better place is there to tell a story that contains the vampires and the lichens? Mia asks Ethan to take Rose to bed, but not before I get a little frisky first. <laughs> Hey, what are you doing, mister? I drop the baby off and take a peek at a newspaper that explains the incident at the Baker family house as a natural gas leak. Knowing that's some bull stuff, I head downstairs just in time for dinner where Ethan tries to grab soup with his hand. This triggers an argument between the two as Ethan is still haunted by what happened in Louisiana and Mia just wants to forget about it. Reprising their roles as Mia and Ethan, Katie O'Hagan is excellent in this, but Todd Soley gets his chance to shine as Ethan is given a larger role, which is weird to say considering he was the main character in the previous game. Director Mori Masasato, who helped write Resident Evil 7, explains that Ethan was seen as a window into the world of Resi 7, so he wasn't given much characterization, but during the development, the team grew attached to him and wanted to flesh him out more in village. Suddenly, Mia gets shot, then the lights go out as Ethan tells her to get down and bullets come from all directions. Chris Redfield shoves a table out of the way and apologizes to Ethan right before shooting an extremely durable Mia a few more times. Ethan gets knocked out as Rose is handed off to Chris and we cut to a memory of a doctor calling to discuss test results for their baby. But Mia is upset, claiming she isn't worried about Rose, indicating it's Ethan that she's worried about, but before we find out more, he receives a work call and the memory ends as we wake up in the snow. A file nearby tells us their mission was to secure Rose and Ethan while eliminating Target. Must be Walmart shoppers, I guess. I trek through the darkness and duck under a barbed wire fence, hoping Ethan has his tetanus shot as he cuts his hand for the first time. You think what happened? into those hands and Resident Evil 7 was bad? Oh, just you wait. Something darts in front of me right before entering an abandoned house. After some searching, I leave to find that the sun has finally come out and I emerge into a clearing that overlooks the village. I venture down into the village that shows signs of a catastrophe with loads of wreckage and animal carcasses around. Eventually, I wander into a house that seems abandoned until a can rolls out from under the pantry. Hey, uh, what happened here? Ah, almost took my head off, man. After nearly ending the game there, some beastly roars ring out, making the old guy look like he may have trusted a fart and paid the price. He hands me a gun and soon after gets pulled through the ceiling while I get pulled through the floor into a cellar littered with bodies. I catch a glimpse of something moving in the back when I'm jumped on my left by a lichen that eats a portion of my hand. It tosses me out into the snow where I gain my composure and earn my first kill of the game. I love the introduction to the village. The developers put a lot of effort into making it as detailed as possible with several paths to open and explore. They took the opposite approach from Resident Evil 7, which was set in a small location rather this game is much more open. I continue exploring, adding another like into the count when I overhear a radio saying there's a survivor watch party at Louisa's house. I never got into that show, but I'd much prefer that over these lichens. Speaking of, they're just hanging out watching me now, making me mad uncomfortable. So I leave them alone and head inside the house, which initiates a survival sequence much like the one in Resident Evil 4's Village, where I simply need to run around and not die. During that sequence, I kill four more lichens before it ends and I'm shot by an arrow and tossed into the creek. Ethan gets surrounded by numerous lichens, with one big hammer-wielding mofo jumping down to get an up-close look at my face. Something we as the player never get to do, even in the third-person mode released in 2022. The bell tolls, prompting their much-desired exit, allowing me to bandage my hand before this old crone informs me that Rose is in the village somewhere, and ever since her arrival, things have gone downhill. I check out a sealed door with two empty slots, then enter the church a little ways down and grab a crest that's surrounded by photos, showing the four lords of the village and the lord of lords while finding a note revealing the other crest is at Louisa's house, exactly where I'm headed to watch Survivor. 
On my way there, I dispatch the three lichens stealing their crops and meet Elena and her injured father who have been left out to dry. I unlock the gate for them, but the house remains locked, so we hoot and holler until Elmer Fudd opens up and points a shotgun at us, wascally wabbits. But Louisa lets us in and orders Fudd to go make sure the grounds are clear. Elena and the note inside mention Mother Miranda used to protect the villagers, making this whole scenario confusing and frightening for them. I sit down with the survivors just in time for this drunken asshole to go around insulting everyone, so we pray for his soul, right before Elena's father begins raging, knocking the lantern to the floor and killing everyone in the room. Ethan forces Elena back and after he leaps on top of me, Elena sends him flying backwards with a couple shotgun blasts while the fire spreads. I quickly find the truck keys and attempt a getaway that fails spectacularly, so instead we climb into the attic where Elena's father follows and she makes the fatal mistake of trying to save him. Welp, that sucks, but at least I got the other crests. Right outside, I watch as Mother Miranda slaughters old Elmer Fudd. Then I bypass the crazy old crone laughing about everyone's death, and insert the two crests into the door and open my way to Castle Dimitrescu. Before I can advance into the castle itself, I meet Heisenberg, not the teacher turned cook, but one of the four lords that basically has Magneto powers. Played by Neil Newbin, who voiced the scumbag Nikolai in the Resident Evil 3 remake, as well as providing voices for the Lycans in this game. He covers Ethan in metal and drags him to an unknown location where the lords bicker over who gets to make a show out of my death. Miranda awards my fate to Heisenberg who releases me and forces me to run for my life as Lycans give chase. I book it through a series of tunnels and traps until I'm stuck in an alcove that allows me to avoid the spinning spikes and free my hands from their bindings. I emerge into the snowy outside and meet the Duke, the merchant of this game and yet another nod to Resident Evil 4. What are you buying? <laughs> Just something an old friend of mine used to say. Now I enter what is probably my favorite level in the game. Inspired by the real-life Pelish Castle in the Transylvania region of Romania, Castle Dimitrescu is a gorgeous location that's fun to explore and feels the most like classic Resident Evil to me. It's not long before I'm ambushed by the three Dimitrescu daughters who take me to their giant 9 foot 6 inch tall mother, Alcina Dimitrescu. She orders her daughters to slice my hand open so she can get a sampling of my blood, announcing it's stale. Before they can feast, she needs to consult Mother Miranda, so her daughters mutilate my hands again and string me up by some hooks. As soon as they leave the room, Ethan says it's his turn to mess these hands up and pulls himself down, finding and pouring healing potion on his hands making them good as new. Well, not quite, because I'm still missing some fingers. Now back out in the main hall, I locate the Duke in the first safe room in the castle. After saving at the typewriter, I head upstairs and open this door that looks as shocked as I do when Bella Dimitrescu ambushes me and her flies crawl under my skin and bust through my hand. Trying to save my poor hands from further harm, I sprint my ass down the halls and jump into the basement where Ethan catches a glimpse of Lady D leaving the wine room. A quick puzzle later, I enter the prison littered with various forms of torture and a new enemy type called the Mora Raika. Based on the Moroi in Romanian folklore, the Mora Raika are failed experiments by Alcina Dimitrescu to create more daughters. Having gone through some terrible blood draining procedures, they've become brainless husks that serve as the most common enemies seen in the castle and bump my kill total up to 17. As I'm about to leave the dungeon, Bella shows up again, shouting something I'm used to hearing when I purposely annoy my wife. You stupid oh. man thing! Exposing her to cold weakens her and allows me to unload until she's taken enough damage and shatters into pieces. I reward myself with a bit of their wine for all the hassle they're putting me through and run back upstairs to place the bottle down and obtain a key that opens up the courtyard, but then I'm suddenly attacked by another one of the Dimitrescu daughters. Uh. I hesitantly escape her grasp and run where she can't follow, entering another section of the castle and listen in on Alcina. What have you done to my daughter? Look, she came on to me, okay? I head down the hallway and into a room that most definitely contains a health code violation, so I drain the blood and let my curiosity guide my feet down the new path. Amoroika falls and disappears under the blood, but thankfully they're brain-dead dum-dums and ripple the blood, letting me know where they'll pop up at. I kill nine of them and find a small lift that carries me up to a balcony overlooking the village, where I drop eaves on a conversation between Lady D and Miranda. She may be a giant vampire, but goddamn is her peripheral vision trash. We only hear her end of it, but it's clear she doesn't like what she hears when she throws her vanity and curses the ceremony, whatever that is, and then charges out of the room. I take note of the empty crib and grab another key and right as I 
I'm about to exit, Elsina re-enters in a real oh shit moment. Lady Dimitrescu is played amazingly by Maggie Robertson, newcomer to voice acting, and while not quite as tall as her character, she stands an even six feet. During the motion capture, they had her stare down at her counterpart's knees while they peered way above her head to really nail down how ridiculously tall the character really is. After scolding my actions since coming into the castle, she shoves me through the floor, sending me back down into the dungeons. I find my way out, but in the middle of pulling the handle, my right hand gets sliced off completely in another unfortunate moment for Ethan's hands. Lady D comes in, rocking claws Freddy Krueger would be jealous of, and begins chasing me around. But Ethan's an evasive guy, grabbing his hand and escaping through the door and onto a lift where he reattaches his hand nonchalantly. The lift puts me back in the courtyard that's now populated by the Moroica, so I sprint back to the safe room for a breather. Like previous Resident Evil games in the new era, Village also contains the stalker enemy type. Lady D will wander around her castle in search of Ethan, with specific areas being safe havens. I wind up running by her and her minions into the next spot, where I add two more kills and learn about the Dimitrescu daughters. Bella, Daniela, and Cassandra were successful attempts at bringing them back to life, but with one major weakness, they can't stand the cold. Downstairs, I get to do what I couldn't at the Baker residence and play a little piano that gives me another key that grants me access to the library where Daniela awaits. I open the skylight and let in that frigid air and use it to my advantage to blast her to kingdom come. I'm sick of bugs. <laughs> Nice one, Ethan. Now that we know for sure Rose isn't in the castle, our objective is to get the hell out, but the front door is sealed unless I can find the keys to open it. I've been given a bunch of those already, so instead we'll be using masks to unlock the way out. While slinking around the castle, I add the final daughter to the count and venture up to the attic where I force this Moroica to play dead for realsies and read a tip on Lady D's weakness. I add the sniper rifle up here to my arsenal and use that in conjunction with my handgun to wipe out the Samkas, who appear to be flying mutations of the Moroica we've grown so fond of killing. I obtain the final mask and head to the entrance and put them in their place. I leave the castle and venture up the stairs where I find a coffin with the dagger mentioned in the note on the roof. But Lady Deeds is bigger than mine and she proves it by impaling my stomach. However, Ethan's feisty ass jams the dagger into her side, forcing her out of the form gamers around the world thirsted after into this eldritch monster. Still pretty hot though. Over the course of about four minutes, I continually shoot her using all of my weapons until eventually I land the final blow with the sniper rifle and she pulls me through the floor and we fall several stories to the ground below where thankfully I land on those big meaty wings to soften the landing. After things quiet down, I notice a flask nearby and grab it, which coincidentally opens up the door so I can leave the castle behind for good. I enter a cave containing some fish that I add to the count with my knife before encountering the old crone again. She informs me that Rose is to be sacrificed and that the path I seek will be open opened up using crests from the four lords. I obtain an important key and exit the cave into something straight out of Middle Earth, except with Umbrella's personal flair. Beyond this are four more lichens to kill and another meeting with the Duke. Played by Aaron LaPlante, the Duke quickly became one of the game's best characters. However, he's not Ethan's favorite here as he tells us that Rose's head is inside the flask we're carrying. He begins freaking out, but the Duke assures us we can save her, pointing us to a house in the village with the red chimney. Your choice. The customer is always right. Oh, come on, don't enable the Karens. <laughs> After each lord has been dealt with, we always head back to the village as kind of a hub level, typically with more enemies to deal with and more treasures to find each time. As I explore and open up more of the village, I kill several animals that can be used to cook and upgrade Ethan's health and abilities. There's of course more lichens littered throughout the place, with a new type being introduced. Covered in armor, it takes and deals more damage, but after some explosives, it eventually falls as well. I end up wandering into the church where it seems another party has decided to set up shop. Being a nosy little bee, I read what's on the screen since apparently whoever left this here doesn't know how to lock it. I find out these people are searching for Rose and Ethan, while also coming across some mold samples in the area. Finally, I find myself inside the house with the red chimney, but nothing is here except in addition to the key I found back in the caves. I run back to my boy and learn the key will help me navigate the village and confront the remaining lords. Next up, Donna Beneviento. I break out into a fog-laden pathway filled with crows and dolls, and if that's not creepy enough, further down a vision of Mia appears. After a few of those, I encounter some red doors that won't open unless I give up my memories. Gladly clearing out my pockets, I insert my photo of Mia in rows and enter where a lift brings me up to take in this gorgeous view before I begin one of the scariest levels in the entire series. Immediately upon entering, things seem off as the house is empty and quiet. Heading upstairs, I take a quick peek at Donna and her ugly ass doll and make note of the yellow flowers we've seen all over since coming up this way. Eventually, I find a lift downstairs where I locate Rose's flask sitting in the lap of the doll from Donna's portrait 
in. But as I approach, the lights go out. Nope, nope, nope. A hard pass on that. The lights come on and all of my items have disappeared while a human-sized doll meant to resemble Mia lies in front of me. This doll is a puzzle in and of itself, providing items I need to advance while also requiring me to backtrack to it in order to solve each one. In fact, the majority of House Beneviento is a puzzle. There are no enemies to fend off, meaning no kills to count here. The developers used this section of the game to further some ideas they had for Resi 7 but never got around to using, which makes total sense because this house is goddamn nightmare inducing. Eventually, after solving most of the puzzles and dealing with Mia chiming in over the radio, I'm forced to watch a short film that makes me think of Sinister. Just shut it off before the lawnmower shows up, please. I obtain some scissors I happily run with to get out of here and find the well from the grainy film with a rocking crib next to it. I climb down to find a key to the breaker box so I can restore power to the elevator, but as soon as I do, the crib breaks and a baby's cries ring out, which isn't even the worst of it, believe it or not. Because when I arrive back upstairs, the Mia doll has been replaced by blood and she tries to give me some words of encouragement. You're right, Mia. All this random blood and this fleshy rope on the ground are fine. <laughs> oh my god, no it's not. Nothing is fine. I run faster than ever and hide in the cupboard a couple rooms over where I get a good long look at this infant monstrosity that not even the nicest person would say is cute. After some time it crawls out and seemingly disappears, but Ethan's frightened breathing perfectly captures how all of us feel playing this part for the first time. The horror in Village was approached differently, with Resident Evil 7's approach being more straightforward. They'd simply ask the question, is this terrifying? Whereas with Village, they wanted to spread the scares out more so players don't become desensitized to it halfway through. In that sense, I'm not certain they succeeded as the majority of Village isn't very scary, but they nailed it with this level. After some time, the baby crawls away, allowing me to leave and open the breaker box that doesn't contain a fuse, so I go to the bedroom and locate that, but as I begin ascending the stairs, the baby comes back, this time making Ethan shriek. <gasps> I run and hide in yet another cupboard until it goes away. Finally, I place the fuse in the box, but the elevator needs some time, forcing me to run from the baby until I can get in there and press the button back up to the house, waving goodbye to old Gatemouth. Back upstairs, Donna's house is now overflowing with dolls, which she uses to attack me. After fending off the initial stabbings, I'm required to find the main doll Angie, and after stabbing it in the head three different times, we take down the second lord and add Donna Beneviento to the count. Before leaving this place, I update my key and grab the rose flask near the front door. On my way back, I noticed the yellow flowers are now dead, no longer useful to deadass Donna as a means of inducing hallucinations and all that come near them. That also means that the dolls I saw hanging reveal themselves to be actual people. Lots of people that are kept company by the Morowaka I kill along the way. Using the updated key, I open up the path back to the first section of the village where a new enemy ambushes Ethan. The Vargalak is a tough enemy, but his toughness doesn't matter when I can cheese it from inside the house and add it to the count. Before before I head towards the next lord, I locate a grenade launcher that will definitely come in handy. The next lord is Salvatore Moreau, the wet dream of one Steve Hadley, and the grossest mf -er in the village. I cut through his slime barricade and slaughter the two piggies for their delicious meat, before continuing down into the mines where it doesn't take long to obtain the rose flask from Moreau. I'll just be taking this. You almost start to feel bad for him when he begins begging for the flask, but then he calls me stupid and uses his slime to prevent my escape sealing his fate. Also voicing Lucas Baker in Resi 7, Jesse Pimentel plays Moreau and succeeds in creating a sad, lowly creature that's far too attached to Mother Miranda. Now that the mines are blocked off, I need to find another way out, but the boat I located needs a key, so I head back into the mines where I dispatch several more lichens to finally get my kill count over 100. Using the boat key, I take it through some caves where a big ass fish makes an appearance. I dock nearby and take on fish more my own size, before encountering Chris Redfield and his men. Again, Chris refuses to let me in on his operation, all while that giant fish destroys the building we're in, sending me crawling out of the water onto another dock. Soon after, Moreau comes out saying my exit is underwater and that Miranda is preparing the ceremony for Rose, so Ethan cuts him deep in return. Miranda sent you to slow me down? You're pathetic. My diss makes him puke so hard he can't handle life and turns back into the fish, initiating a quick chase that has me jumping onto dry land. Up the path is the switch to drain the water, but there's no power, requiring me to head towards 
towards the windmills to restore it so I can leave this place. This next section has Ethan running on the docks while Moreau swims around trying to knock us into the water. It's easy enough to avoid him unless the game gives you a big old middle finger and has him knock you off the dock right as you're getting on the stairs here while he screams. I succeed the third time and continue along the docks until I find the crank I need to restore power and zipline back to the first windmill to get it done. I drain the reservoir, forcing Moreau out of the water and follow him where I begin this boss battle. Moreau might be a Miranda cuck, but he's no pushover. He has some attacks that can devastate me and takes quite a bit of punishment. After roughly 8 minutes of running around and avoiding his gross attacks, I deal a death blow using my shotgun. In death as he was in life. Disgusting. I traverse back into the mines into the shack I met Moreau in, taking his key and spotting the Cadeau, which looks suspiciously like the mold we fought on the Baker property. The TV to my left clicks on with Heisenberg offering to help Ethan out if I'm able to obtain his flask located within a stronghold outside the village. Honestly, some help here sounds fantastic, so I expedite my booty outside, killing the enemy stationed out here and obtaining the Magnum that I utilize on another Varkalak. After that's done, I add three more animals to the count before entering the processing building that contains a new enemy the Urias Drac, a giant axe-wielding enemy similar to the Lycan one we saw early on. It takes a whole lot of damage, but thankfully there's a way to cheese this one. I go in and out of the door, shooting it and adding the flying nuisances it summons, until it eventually falls and becomes just another number for me to tally. Outside, some Lycans attempt to ambush me and pay the price, sniping one and blowing up the rest. However, following the other path takes me directly to the stronghold that is absolutely packed with Lycans. There's a lot of them outside and inside in this action-packed sequence sequence that has my total kills land at 190 when it's all said and done. Capcom initially wanted the players to struggle to survive, leaning heavily into the survival aspect. The plan was to have way less ammo while maintaining a healthy number of enemies like we dealt with here. The QA team provided feedback to the developers that it made the game way less fun to play, so either the amount of enemies had to be dialed back or they needed to provide more ammo. I'm sure you can guess which decision they made. I head further into the stronghold, taking a peek at a feeding session. It seems like they're like in that, right? <laughs> yeah. After that terrible pun, I deserve some punishment, exiting into some caves and being forced to fight the Urias we saw way back at the intro to the village. Unlike the one I cheesed mere moments ago, I don't have that benefit here. It summons additional lichens to aid in the fight, and after a few minutes of running around like a chicken, I end it with a shot from my sniper rifle. With that done, I'm rewarded with the final flask containing Rose's body, which comes paired with another conversation with Heisenberg telling me to place all the flasks in the altar and come meet him at his factory. Not one to waste time, I promptly make my I exit, killing the Moroika that make the mistake of showing their faces and bump my kills to over 200. Before I place the flasks in the altar, I need to do a quick bit of inventory management that's taken right out of Resident Evil 4, albeit a little less satisfying. I place the flasks into the altar, opening up the way to Heisenberg's rusty palace, where he swears I'm not entering a trap. He greets me inside, shutting up whoever is making the noise down below, and offers an alliance to take down Miranda together using my daughter, but Ethan is far from interested. That hurts Heisenberg's feelings to the point he's ready to drop me in the hole where the revving engine sound is coming from. You don't want to find out what's in that hole. Stubborn in his ways, Ethan says no again and gets sent below to come face to face with plagiarism. Well, supposed plagiarism anyway, as the Sturm shows up looking very similar to the propeller head seen in the 2013 film Frankenstein's Army. Maybe he just really loved that film. I outrun the monster and jump into a chute where it can't follow and wind up in a scrap heap. I climb out and add three haulers to the count. Very similar to the Moroika, the haulers seem to be all male with some sick VR headsets fastened to their face. Once out of the trash heap, we get a good look at the factory, revealing Heisenberg is building an army of mechanically enhanced monsters to aid in his clash with Miranda. While I think the factory is a creepy location, it's my least favorite in the game as it mostly looks the same and the enemies aren't quite as fun to fight. Outside of the haulers, we mostly face off against soldats, or variations of them. German for soldier, the soldats are experiments by Heisenberg, using the Cadeau to replace their heart with the sole purpose of destruction and their only weakness being the red glowing exhaust on their chest or back. Exploring the factory is a series of ups and downs and backtracking until we eventually bump the kills near 250, obtain Heisenberg's key, and tell him to stop using me for free therapy. I don't give a shit about your family drama. However, before I can get to the boss man, I have one more thing to deal with, the Sturm. This mini-boss takes a little time to defeat as it runs around destroying walls while Ethan avoids 
avoids it and shoots with the weak point above its ass. After enough damage has been dealt, it begins spewing flames, and a few more shots later, I end it with my shotgun. In the next room over, I rifle through Mr. H's journal, where he continues whining about Miranda and makes a comment about how interesting my body is. Not certain if I should take that as a compliment, Heisenberg shows me how interesting his body really is, and sends me back to the bottom of the factory where I meet up with Chris again. Here he finally gives me some answers, stating he shot Miranda impersonating Mia and that he'll explain everything. Miranda's fucking insane. Oh, okay then. It's revealed that the mold originated here, and that Miranda used it to experiment on people in the village for decades, but right now Heisenberg is the immediate threat, so Chris stays back to plant explosives in the factory while I jump in the souped up tractor. Made using components Heisenberg can't control, I head up the lift into our battleground. This fight is so wacky and unlike anything else in the game. If you're not careful though, he can quickly end things since Ethan is unable to heal while driving apparently. And once he knocks me out of the vehicle, I make quick work of him on foot using my sniper. However, the final blow is dealt in a cutscene. With the fourth lord dead, Chris gives me a ring and tells me to wait at my location. But Mia Randa beats him here to explain that Rose is essentially a superior Evelyn and that she intends to use her to bring back her long deceased daughter. And when she wraps up her villainous monologue, she decides it's time to cleanse herself using the blood from Ethan's heart. We flip over to Chris Redfield as his team confirms the death of Ethan, and it's here that I finally recognize his voice after trying to figure out who he was. Jeff Shine returns to the world of Resident Evil after playing Carlos in the Resident Evil 3 remake and leaving us in a cold, cruel, Carlos world. To cope with that fact, we have plenty of things to shoot and kill in this sequence. After witnessing Chris's old employer, the BSAA, get bitch slapped by the Mega Mice seat, we head down into the village, killing nearly 100 lichens in a short span, while I damage the mold and open a hole underground using the Hammer of Dawn. Wait, wrong game. Once underground, I encounter another Urdius, but this one is mostly impervious to all my weapons, except the mold damaging type. Luckily, there's a hole up above that lets me utilize that weapon so I can finish it off with my assault rifle. With that out of the way, we come up on the heart of the Mega Mice. Chris tosses a powerful explosive into it and begins searching the immediate area, where we find plenty of notes, journals, and photographs providing tidbits of lore. Miranda outlines the Four Lords' failures as potential vessels for her daughter's reincarnation, and it's clear she messed up by not using this guy, because with a face like that, he could do anything. Most interestingly, we read a letter from Oswell Spencer, thanking Miranda for inspiring him to create Umbrella Corporation in order to research the progenitor virus found in Africa and its effects on humans. So we can pin all this bullshit on Miranda. After trying to absorb that knowledge, we uncover a captive Mia and relay some unfortunate news about her husband, but her reaction isn't exactly what you'd expect. You don't understand how special he is. Suddenly, we cut to Ethan with an apparition of Evelyn divulging some interesting news. That Ethan died at the hands of Jack Baker three years ago. Ethan was killed soon after his first scuffle with Mia and revived by Evelyn's mold as a perfect copy. On that wild note, Ethan wakes up in the back of the Duke's wagon, who takes me to Miranda's location where I add four more basic-ass Morawaika to the count before the final encounter. I interrupt her mid-ritual, where she revives an intact rose instead of her own baby initiating the start of the fight. Your body certainly is normal. Can you guys quit body shaming me already? The basics here are to shoot the shit out of her until she dies. It's that simple. I die once after accidentally hitting the control button twice, wasting valuable healing items. However, the second time around, I blast that baby snatcher in the face with my shotgun for the final kill of the game. I pick up my baby, but my body is giving out and won't let me make it very far. Ethan hands Rose off to Chris and snatches the detonator from his hands, sending Chris back to ensure his family's survival while he stays here to ensure the death of the Mega Mice. Chris gets back to his team in a hurry, telling Mia that Ethan is divorcing her to stay in Romania. The explosion goes off while Chris examines the dead BSAA soldier, confirming it's not actually human but a bioweapon. While he sets a course for their HQ, we get the title card, as the end credits play over the same story that began the game and we get a sneak peek at Rose Winter's post credits as a segue into her own DLC, The Shadows of Rose. While she drives off, we'll examine the final number. I finished Resident Evil Village with a total of 346 kills, with over a quarter of those belonging to Chris, despite his short stint at the end of the game. I wrapped the game up with three deaths, the two Moreau ones I'll file away under the BS category. That brings my final kill death ratio to 115.3. I was able to complete Village in 9 hours and 33 minutes, which gives us a kill on average every 1.66 minutes and a death every 3 hours and 11 minutes. Resident Evil Village built upon the gameplay elements introduced in Resi 7, while 
pulling a ton of inspiration from one of the most iconic games of all time in Resi 4. It was a blast to play with a bonkers story that has me interested in where the franchise will go next now that the Winter Saga is complete. Which character do you want to see return in the ninth installment? Jill? Claire? Or perhaps someone new or unexpected? Let me know in the comments and keep an eye out for the original God of War videos coming out next. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next video. I'm King DeShane, signing off for now.